News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehi Swuhib in Washington. And coming up, a crime analyst at the Institute for Security Studies on Crimes Increases in South Africa being suppressed. Also, the stepson of former Malawi president, Peter Mutarika, is arrested in connection with the discovery of a mass grave. An Algerian court has sentenced 49 people to death in the killing of a man falsely accused of starting forest fires. And Cameroon and Ghana lose their openers at the World Cup. We have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Police in Malawi have arrested the stepson of former President Peter Mutarika in connection with the discovery of a mass grave last month. Police say Tadikari Mafabuza turned himself into police yesterday. The grave found in a forest contained 30 bodies believed to be those of illegal Ethiopian migra- immigrants. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. Tadikira Mafubza is a son of former President Peter Mutalika's wife, Gertrude, whom he married in 2014. Police say the arrest, the first since the discovery of the mass grave, is a result of the investigation they are conducting. Peter Kalaya is the spokesperson for the Malawi Police Service. Uh, we have arrested him because we have evidence that he is connected to a case that we are investigating at the moment, which is to do with a mass grave that was found in Nzimba district, where 30 bodies of suspected victims of human trafficking, suspected to be Ethiopians, were exhumed. Some local media reports indicate police also impounded a vehicle used to transport suspected Ethiopian immigrants being trafficked to South Africa. At the moment, I will not be able to confirm or deny that because anything, any information to do with that, I'm afraid, might jeopardize the stage of our investigations at this moment. In the preliminary police investigation, authorities found temporary travel documents with the names and nationalities of the deceased. Police also found SIM cards of Ethiopian mobile phone network providers. Now Malawians are waiting for the results of autopsies conducted to establish the causes of the death. Earlier in November, Mutalika told a press conference at his residence in Manguji district that he was shocked at the government's silence on the cause of the death of the migrants. Mutalika said Malawians and the international community deserved to know what happened. Police spokesperson Kalaya told VOA Thursday that the police cannot release findings from the pathologists on what caused the deaths. At the moment, they have given us a preliminary postmortem report, but we are not in a position to give out to the public what's in the preliminary report. At an appropriate time, we are going to inform Malawians and the rest of the world what is in there, because anything that we say at this moment, looking at the stage where we are with our investigations, we are afraid it might affect our investigations of the case. Kalaya said Mafuja is expected to appear in court Friday to answer charges on human trafficking and that more arrests will follow soon. There was no immediate comment from Mutalika on the arrest. Also, spokesperson for Mutalika's Democratic Progressive Party, Shadrick Namalomba, who sometimes speaks for Mutalika's family, told VOA Thursday that he would not comment on the arrest of the former president's stepson. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. An Algerian court has sentenced 49 people to death in the killing of a man falsely accused of starting forest fires last year. According to the French news agency AFP, a crowd in the Tizi Ouzou region beat to death 38-year-old Jamel Ben Ismael when he turned himself in at a police station as a suspect in blazes that killed up to 90 people. He was dragged from a police van, mutilated and set on fire. 
Later, details found that Ben Ismael, an artist from the Milana region, 230 miles to the west, had traveled to Tizi Ozu to help put out the flames. The new service says, although the court imposed the death penalty, the punishment is not likely to be carried out. Algeria has maintained a moratorium on executions since 1993. The court sentenced 28 other defendants to jail terms of, of those two to 10 years without parole. Two doctors without borders, MSF patients, were recently killed in Biera, Mozambique, after a string of brutal murders over the past two months that appear to have targeted women. The two slain women were sex workers, MSF sexual and reproductive health care nurse Lucy O'Connell in Cape Town, South Africa, says two men were questioned and detained in con connection with the killings but were never charged. She tells VOA's Carol Van Dam that sex workers are seen as having little value and are often subjected to discrimination and violence in Biera and other parts of Southern Africa. Sex workers are often murdered without consequence. So for us, it's the first time that we have something like this happening. You know, we've been having a project in Beira since 2014, and um, we have never had this situation happened before, where two of our community engaged sex workers have been killed. Would you say that it seems as though this is more of a problem where women are who engage in this kind of profession are more stigmatized in, in yeah. certain parts of Africa? Well, as long as sex work stays stigmatized, I think that this situation, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, will carry on. So stigmatization, you know, criminalization, discrimination, marginalization is what poses the risk to people engaged in sex work, women, men, transgender people as well. What do you as a kind of healthcare practitioner in, in South Africa, what do you try to do um, when you reach sex workers and, and try to make them aware of their increased risk? What kind of things do you do? So we do peer-led programming. Uh, we actually have uh, colleagues. It's part of our staff. We employ sex worker peer educators to be part of our teams uh, so that we actually get sensitized ourselves to their needs and we educate them into the health service delivery uh, packages that we are able to offer. So, you know, and we do tackle issues of health around HIV infection, TB infection and treatment, uh, sexual and reproductive health services, broadly speaking, you know, from the sexual, sexually transmitted infections to contraceptive needs to safe abortion care. I would imagine that you kind of see the government as a partner in trying to increase safeguarding for these kinds of people. What do you want to see the government do? Well, we'd like to sh to see they show visible support for sex workers and their communities to stand in solidarity with sex workers. Um, you know, Mozambique has uh, a decriminalized, apparently, bill, but there are lots of bylaws that criminalize poverty, you know, which is loitering and crowding around the road or, you know, dress code and soliciting. So, you know, we'd, we'd like that to be further looked into, you know, to use a legal framework to defend the basic human rights of women and of sex workers. But also it's to take legal action against people who violate these. Yeah. When you talk about criminalizing poverty, that's the way you put it. It sounds like the government really isn't a partner in trying to uh, protect these women. Yeah, well, I mean... I think that governments um, understand uh, the situation of their populations in different ways. Um, I think that a lot of the misunderstanding of what goes on with the lives of sex workers is, is, is ignorance. That's Lucy O'Connell, Doctors Without Borders Sexual and Reproductive Health Care Nurse. O'Connell was speaking with my colleague Carol Van Dam from Cape Town, South Africa. <music> The UN says more than 50,000 migrants have died worldwide since 2014. 
That milestone was included in a new report from the Missing Migrants Project of the International Organization for Migration, or IOM. The study says that while thousands of deaths have been documented across migration routes each year, very little has been done to address the consequences of these tragedies, let alone prevent them. The report says the nationality of over 30,000 people in the study are not known. Of those whose nationality could be identified, more than 9,000 were from Africa, over 6,500 were from Asia, and 3,000 from the Americas. Africa is the second deadliest region for people on the move, with more than 9,000 migration-related deaths documented since 2014. The IOM is calling for the international community to prioritize search and rescue operations, improve migration pathways, and adopt legislation that protects people on the move. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. South African police say 10,000 new officers will be on the streets by Christmas after a jump in violent crime with murders up 14%, carjacking up 24%, and kidnappings doubling. Police say 7,000 people, almost 1,000 of them women, were murdered between July and September, and 10,000 women were raped in those three months. The disturbing trend comes just ahead of Friday's 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Vicky Stark reports from Cape Town, South Africa. The crime figures from July to September were announced by the Minister of Police, Becky Tele. The crime figures show that aggression and violence are at warring levels in South Africa. Tele has promised citizens that the 10,000 additional officers will make a difference during the Christmas holiday period and beyond. But crime analyst at the Institute for Security Studies, Gareth Newman, is sceptical. He says the crime stats show that the upward trend in murders that started over a decade ago has continued and increased, and the rate of increase has worsened. He says government's crime-fighting efforts are failing. They simply are not able to utilize the vast resources of the state. We're talking about a large criminal justice budget around 140 to 150 billion rand annually. Police organization with almost 180,000 personnel simply aren't able to utilize the resources effectively in a manner that brings uh, perpetrators to justice. For example, Newman says from 2012 until last year, the ability of the South African police service to solve murders has dropped by 50%. He has urged the President and the Minister of Police to take note of the reports from at least five government-sponsored commissions of inquiry or panels of experts looking into policing over the last 10 years and to make the necessary changes. We need a completely new rethink, starting with the rejuvenation of the top management issue on the South African Police Service, because that is where the problem starts. That management structure is at war with itself. The founder of the non-governmental organization 1000 Women, One Voice, Tina Tiart, agrees that there is much room for improvement in the criminal justice system. She and her team are getting ready to participate in the annual 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, which starts Friday. They'll be hosting circles for women in communities called Hear Me Too. But on a national scale, we are organizing postcards to the president, and on the post postcards, we will give him solutions, the solutions that we as women have come up with. And what are some of the suggestions? To strengthen um, a relationship between police and community-based organizations where they work together, not just on a police forum, but actually in police stations. Also to train a lot more lay legal supporters so that women can be accompanied to, to the various services they need, if it's the police, the courts, the clinics. Tiart says they are also training women in rural areas to take in GBV victims until they can get to places of safety. Vicky Stark for VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa. 
refugees from around the world who resettled in the Washington area are getting together to celebrate their first Thanksgiving in the United States. In their newly adopted country, the United States, hundreds of refugees from all parts of the world gathered in early November to celebrate Thanksgiving. Many of these refugees celebrated the annual holiday for the first time. This is Anila Karimazai. By coming here, I feel very proud and happy to be here with everyone, with so much diverse people. And I feel happy that I get to celebrate Thanksgiving with so many happy people. Thanksgiving in America is observed annually on the fourth Thursday in November. It celebrates a feast shared between English colonists in America and indigenous people in the early 1600s. Most Americans cook food like roasted turkey, sweet potatoes, and gravy while spending the holiday with friends and family. For 